Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. I would like to give a very special thank you to the reformed members of the channel. Inner Scare Wifey, Denise S., Through Scrutiny, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie DW, Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Niece. If you would like to become a member of Back to Ashes or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all of that information can be found down below. Also, if you are new here or haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the video out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Middle of Nowhere Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within the video. A while ago, like two months ago, I found a machete that was buried in the dirt, but not really deep at all. It looks like someone kicked dirt onto it and walked away. I took it home to hang on my wall. Yesterday, the coroner and PD came to my mom's house after I found her boyfriend dead on the floor. They searched the house for drugs and took my machete. They came back asking whose it was. I said it was mine and I had found it in the woods. The machete had dried blood on it that belonged to a girl who went missing not too long ago. Me, my ex-boyfriend, and another friend had been visiting friends up north. We live in Germany. Me and one of the friends we were visiting are Wiccan. A holiday was coming up, so we asked our friends to join us for a ritual. For this, we needed corn leaves. So, we are out for a quest to find corn leaves. It's pitch black and probably like 11 p.m. We're already out of the city and in the middle of nowhere on a path between fields. We are four people. I'm holding the flashlight. Everyone's got a beer and music and the mood is pretty good. Nobody is scared. Then, my friend who's walking slightly in front of me says, Something's walking there, and stops walking. I just get this instant chill and hear something rustling in the high grass besides the path and just scream. And I don't know why I did. I just got scared, like from one to a hundred in a millisecond. And she goes, Oh, oh it's okay, I'm sorry, I think it's just a deer. And the others are like, yeah, just a deer. And I'm calming down really fast because I'm thinking, oh, hell, okay, I just got scared by the deer. It's fine. It's okay. When it rustles again, but I don't see anything. Nothing. Like I should be able to see a freaking deer because I'm holding the flashlight. So I should have seen something. But the grass on both sides is moving and rustling and I'm screaming because I'm scared. Then my friend says she saw something standing at the end of the road, then crawl across. I have still yet seen anything and she starts screaming too. The other two aren't saying anything. Then, while I'm already hysterical and crying and screaming, we hear rustling again and then giggling like evil giggling and I'm truly not trying to be dramatic here but we all confirmed afterwards that's what we heard so I'm starting to have a panic attack and I'm crying and we just book it back to town like I've never run that fast in my entire life it wasn't a deer it wasn't an animal I know what lives there it giggled like an actual human child and my friend and me both just don't know what we should think so yeah i would say that was pretty damn spooky a 
It's probably not that creepy, but in the woods near my home, some friends and I love to explore and find undiscovered places in the woods. For a bit of context, we hear loud bangs at night very often. Not sure if they're gunshots or fireworks or whatever. Well, one day we decide to go through some thick brush that we've never been through before. We found three chairs facing each other. One had two bullet holes through the back and another one was knocked down. There was also a bag of what we think was drugs in the middle there. We left soon after. That was four years ago. That place is now a well-known drug dealer spot in our friend group, and we have to educate the newcomers on that area of the woods. Okay, to start off, I'm so sorry this became more of a written piece instead of a short story. I expected it to become just a small story people could read. But this is one of those stories that my husband and I still trot out occasionally to this day. It wasn't exactly in the woods, but it was, at best as we could tell, on uninhabited land that was surrounded by forests on all sides so woods adjacent at the very least. Most of my family for the longest time was centrally located in Florida, going back generations. That's changed as people have gotten older, passed on, and of course needed to move out due to the job market in the state stagnating. But back then I was sort of the black sheep of the family for being one of the very first to get out. I still tried to make trips down there to see them, though, and time and money allowed for it since I was still in my early 20s, something trying to keep my head above water financially. Anyway, for this particular trip, I decided to introduce my then boyfriend, now husband, to everyone. And on top of for once having company on an extended road trip, it was also time for us to try out our shiny, newfangled GPS to get us to where we were going. Since it had been long enough since my last journey that I didn't really trust my memory to lead me through Florida's roads. At least, not until I was in my home city proper. Turned out to be an almost entertainingly terrible trip. We were hit by fog and rain at the state border to the point where visibility was nearly zero. And for one of the few times that I'd seen in years in that state, we got hit by hail in big enough pieces that it actually broke one of my car's wipers. After debating whether he wanted to chance stopping to try to find a place to pick up a replacement, and essentially having to navigate this terrible weather with an increasingly shaky GPS device, we were at the least inhabited stretch of the road, and the instructions set that device drew from definitely reflected it. In the middle of the night, we decide to keep on trucking, and I may do with what visibility I could. Besides, I figured being able to read the road signs wouldn't matter so much since we were on our computerized road map giving us instructions. Well, that's what I thought. Except, at some point, that calm, mechanical voice instructed us to take an unexpected turn off the main road. And after a little bit of back and forth with my special someone, we have jokingly decided to go with the flow and take it. Figuring we could easily make a U-turn if it was completely off the mark. For all we knew, it was operating with information about some kind of road obstruction or accident that we couldn't see yet. Because the weather was still absolute crap. So we drive along for a good amount of distance and pretty much within the first couple of miles, every other bit of traffic had dropped off. Then, a few minutes and another turn later, the road makes an abrupt transition from concrete to gravel, and I shrug my shoulders and chalk it up to at least a somewhat entertaining dog leg in our trip. 
even if I still couldn't see any of the landscape in this soupy weather. I tell my SO to just keep his eyes peeled for a good place to turn around. Since our two-lane road has turned into an unpaved one-lane path with a ditch running up each side, surrounded by increasingly heavy trees. One bit of silver lining, though, is that the horrible spew falling from the sky at this point finally pauses, giving us a bit of relief and making me not so afraid of getting our car stuck in the mud while making my eventual turnaround. That also means we get an unobscured view as the woods break on one side of us, revealing what looks like an old farmhouse sticking out like a sore thumb and... Oh boy, we both fell absolutely silent when we saw this thing. It looked very abandoned, which is itself not unexpected. Florida backcountry, as I was familiar with, tended to be flat as a pancake with fields and sporadic wooden sections. And every once in a while, you get some abandoned building usually from someone who owned more land than they could maintain or just couldn't afford anymore. This fit the bill with its empty broken windows and peeling whitewashed boards. Although it had a surprisingly well-maintained clear space around it, with evenly cut grass in a stretch about as big as a decent-sized yard, and festooned around the clear space, sometimes sitting up pieces of raggedy furniture or set up in little dioramas on the saggy porch of the building, are dolls. Literally hundreds of varyingly shaped dolls. Sometimes marionette types with worn down joints or stuffed cabbage patch style. One human-sized mannequin sat on the rocking chair so that it stared at you not five feet from the road, which was especially disorienting because the pattern cleared fully. So you just saw this head and shoulders emerging from the mush before you could see it. It wasn't actually a person. I'm not ashamed to say I veered over as sharply as I could on that narrow path because it fooled me for a handful of seconds. We're both rubbernecking like crazy as we pass this thing. Because the more you look, the more you see. All the attention to detail, someone went into set everything up. Some of the dolls are sitting at tiny doll-sized tables having tea with one another with cracked and dirty glasses. Some of them have clothes but no hair. Some have hair but are slumped on the ground like they've been forgotten, while others are very purposefully placed. I can't even imagine how much effort had been sunk into that little abandoned house, but only on its dull residence. We passed that place by without a single word said, waited until it had finally veered out of our sight, and then I turned us around regardless of how narrow that path was. We had come to the silent senses that our little side trip was now done. When we went by that place again, I was going about as quickly as I judged our janky lemon of a car could go. But I'm sure Hubs got another eyeful the second time around. Nowadays, we still occasionally reference the dollhouse when talking about trips to Florida. And then one of us will air guitar a riff from the dueling banjos of Deliverance. But it's definitely one of those things you can only find entertaining from several states away. And not a dead-eyed mannequin staring seemingly directed at your car as you drive past. The story takes place in August of 2013 in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I am a USAF Security Forces Airman, military policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick, another military cop, 
and I decided to go explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days off starting on roads that we knew, finding roads we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to the paved roads. On this particular day, with the storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road we had never been on and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend in the thick fir trees and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the Aspen Grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat off the truck to check it out. I am not very tall, only about five foot five inches regardless. The table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed he was looking back into the aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread and felt certainly that there was someone in the tent, and if we could see that tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in this area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely someone camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any other movement or hear any sound coming from it. Nick suggested I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. No response. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area, but we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought about it all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp. Should we need to leave in a hurry, he would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, Several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built. No wood collected. The tent, the tent, was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave and tell Nick what I had seen, and as I left, I heard Nick start yelling, Let's go, let's get the hell out of here. Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat-up old Ford Taurus on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. 
I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way he had come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still do not know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police and they promised to send a trooper out to check out the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the women's clothing were all gone, though he could tell people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to the area and do not intend to. When I was a theater study student in the Midlands of England, we had our little theater company on tour around the local rural countryside as part of the practical side of the course. Being a proper London girl, I wasn't best pleased with the prospect of roughing it in a 10-person van. There were 15 of us in this van, by the way. But for the sake of my art, I stopped being a silly tart and threw myself into it with enthusiasm. One day, we broke down in the middle of nowhere, and by the time the AA blow got to us, and in turn, by the time we got to the campsite, all the spaces in the campsite had been taken. We had three performances locally the next day. It had gone 8 p.m., and it was almost pitch dark. We didn't have many options left open to us. Our director said it would be best if we drove the van into the near forest and all sleep in the van for the night. And as it was too late to continue driving around and having an early start the following day, we reluctantly agreed. We found a quiet part of the forest that was open with not so many trees. And by 9.30, we were all settled into the van, if a little cramped and cold. We were all 19 and 20 year olds and it was a big adventure. At around 11.30, I was stirred awake by one of the colleagues screaming and another bloke saying, this is all so bad. We are all screwed. To my complete horror through my sleep blurred eyes, I saw that our little vein was completely surrounded by about 50 men dressed in what appeared to be old fashioned rural farming clothes with handmade torches all burning brightly. I started panicking but didn't scream. I couldn't take my eyes off the men. They weren't moving an inch, didn't have an expression on their face, not even when we bibbed the horn at them. Two of the blokes even got out of the van and shouted at the men, to the total horror of everyone else. Nothing. Needless to say, we were all terrified. Every time we tried to move the van, the men moved a step forward. At 1.30, all the men suddenly just turned around and walked away through the trees. We were absolutely knackered, too tired to drive anywhere else, so we took turns keeping watch in case the men came back, but luckily, they never did. To preface this, I want to say last year I spent about 32 days in the woods, either scouting, hunting, or fishing. The year before that, I spent about 22 days. This doesn't include my regular hunts and camping adventures, which is in the past three years, adds up to just over 100 days. I've been hunting since I was nine, and I've spent a lot of time outdoors in various different parts of the U.S. and in Canada. I've seen and heard a lot of strange shit, but this takes the cake. 
I was in Kohutta, North Georgia wilderness, for seven days scouting for bears, wild hogs, and deer, prepping for a hunting trip later that year. I had hiked in at about 10 miles and then went off trail for another three to five miles. Basically, I was out in the middle of nowhere. Since I was alone, I was using a hammock that has a built-in bug net, and I had a rain fly over it. I spent about three days halfway up a mountain just looking for a good place to hunt. I saw three to four good-sized bears, about ten hogs, and came across some good-sized deer. On the fourth day, I was going to head down to a small stream that I had marked on my GPS, and then set up camp, restock on water, and prep for the two-day hike back. I could have gone faster but wanted to be able to look for any animal sign along the way. As I was approaching this small stream, I noticed a tent which I was excited to see. As I had been completely alone for a few days and it's always nice to run into another hiker. Generally, us wilderness folks are pretty down to earth. As I got closer to the tent, I noticed that there was a small pack on the ground just outside of it. I figured the person couldn't have been too far from where the camp was, so I set up my camp about 30 yards away, and with about four hours of daylight left, started cooking some dinner. Two hours later, I was starting to wonder where this person was, given that I was in the wilderness, and it was a one-plus-day hike out. There wasn't much I could do, but I did hike around the site, making a circle as I went out to look for any signs of struggle, just in case of a bear attack, or maybe they had had an injury. I got about a fourth of a mile from the campsite, walking a circle, but I didn't find anything. As night came, no one showed. I started a fire in hopes that the person would be able to find where they set up and have some light. Fires burn really bright and are very easy to see from far away. After eating, searching, and hoping that the person was going to make it back, I called it a night. I had a small flask with me and took a couple swigs of whiskey, jumped into my hammock with my pistol, and attempted to go to sleep. I sleep pretty hard. I mean, really hard. Regardless of where I am. It literally annoys my friends because I can always seem to just fall asleep and stay asleep, regardless of where in the world we are. But this night was different. I felt like something was off, but I figured it was just me worrying about this person who, by all my accounts, was completely missing. So, for the first time in my life, I woke up to the sound of what I thought was footsteps, but not in the sense of footsteps on leaves, but not in the sense of uh, footsteps on leaves, but what a heavy-footed person would make walking on an old wood floor. It was extremely loud. I got my gun, grabbed my headlamp, stored in a small compartment just above me, and waited to see if it would stop. Right at that moment, it did. Then I saw something that scared the ever-living shit out of me on my rainfly. The gleam of a flashlight. Faint, but there. I shouted, Hello? And right when I did, it sounded like ten people suddenly running away from me in every direction. I dropped out of my hammock onto the ground, frantically turning on my headlamp, shining it all around me. But didn't see shit. My heart was racing pretty bad, but I thought it might have just been the reflection of the moon on the rainfly. Yeah, that was it. And those footsteps running away from me was probably armadillos or something, even though their eyes shine, and they are pretty easy to spot. Problem was, there was no moon. I'd never seen an armadillo above 2,000 feet. Not to say that they don't live up there, I've just never seen one. And for some reason, the campsite I set up by was gone. 
the fire had been put out by water. It was apparent because there was not a damn coal in the thing. I thought for sure it was about 4 a.m., but I had only been asleep about an hour. At this point, I wanted to leave, but hiking out into the wilderness while it's dark is always a very bad idea. So I grabbed my flask took a swig of whiskey, removed my rain flies so I could see out of my hammock and around the area I was in and tried my hardest to go back to sleep. I'm laying down when I saw some light hit the trees above me. It was clear it was coming from downstream and I got out of my hammock and started yelling, Hey, y'all need any help? No response. I saw whatever was putting out the light and it spun around and started heading downstream extremely fast. At this point, my body had pumped through adrenaline, then it had blood, and I was exhausted from it all. I finally was able to fall asleep and woke up at around 7 a.m. When I did, I noticed that my water filter I had left out was missing. It's a gravity filter and it hangs on a tree filtering water down into my main bladder that I put in my backpack and my water bladder sitting at the base of the tree. It looked like it was cut down the middle with a knife. They cut down my bear bag, which had food in it, and took some of it. The creepiest part of all of it was that they went through my bag, which was under my hammock, while I was sleeping. I checked the bear bag before I went back to sleep the second time, and it was still there, hanging, and my bag under my hammock hadn't been touched. I packed all my shit and hightailed it out of there, keeping my pistol close to me and moving as fast as I could. I ended up making the hike back in just under 15 hours. I hiked the trail part in the night, on my hike back. There were no cars parked at the trailhead, and the DNR said they had only seen my car there. Since then, I haven't gone out there without any friends. I reported all of this to the local DNR, and they looked at me like I was crazy. I don't know. Maybe I am. I found a crucified grizzly bear once about 200 kilometers, 100 miles roughly for you Americans, into the Canadian forest. Nowhere near towns or even roads, so I'm not entirely sure how they were able to lift such a big animal up a good 30 feet up the tree, considering the average weight of a male grizzly can get up to 600 kilograms or 1,320 pounds. And this was definitely not an average size grizzly, although not the biggest I've seen. By far the most we should get the hell out of here moment I've ever felt though. I realize that sounds hard to believe, especially given that it's the internet and people love to make up huge claims. And frankly, if I wasn't the one telling the story, I'd probably doubt it too. So feel free not to believe me. There's no hard feelings if so. But I can promise you this, this story is 100% real and still haunts my nightmares. I was 14 in the Boy Scouts and we were on a canoeing trip down the Buffalo River in Arkansas. It was a six day trip and it was just our little crew of about 10 boys and three adults. We had not seen anyone outside of our crew for days. We would canoe several miles and pick some random spot to sleep each night. This one night, me and a friend decided we were not going to sleep in the tent. We wanted to sleep in some hammocks by the river. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night being eaten alive by mosquitoes and decided that this was a stupid idea and began walking to my tent that my tent buddy had set up and was sleeping in without me. The field we chose to camp on that night was quite large, so the tents were spread out very apart. I am walking by one of the tents and I see this shape huddled up next to it. 
and I assumed it was the boy's backpack, but it was oddly shaped and could not have been a person. It was very dark and I couldn't see. For some reason, I decided to kick it while I was walking past to make sure it was just a bag. When I kicked it, it grunted in pain. It surprised the ever-living shit out of me. You must understand that we are in the middle of nowhere, out in the wilderness, so my first thought was that Adam, the guy who was supposed to be sleeping in that tent, was outside of it for some reason. So I knelt down beside the tent and asked, What are you doing out here? The man replied, I like you people. That's when my heart nearly exploded out of my chest. This was a stranger. This was not Adam. Fear seized me. I noticed he had a knife in a sheath on his belt loop. I was trying my best to stay calm. I will never understand why I thought that I needed to get that knife away from him. I should have run screaming, but I didn't want to alarm him. I went to grab the knife, and he grabbed my arm and said, You need to go to bed. I said, oh, Okay. And got up and walked the remaining hundred or so feet to my tent. I woke up my tent mate damn near hysterical. Just knowing he was going to come in at any second and kill us both. I woke him up and told him the story, and he, being much braver than me, went out there and walked around the camp and said he didn't see anyone and he thought I was making the whole thing up. The next morning when he woke me up and told me the adult wanted to talk to me, I walk out the tent and I can see people's shit just strewn everywhere. Apparently the guy, whoever he was, was going outside each tent and going through the backpacks looking for stuff to steal. That's my guess. One of the adults had an expensive camera missing. The adults went and searched for signs that someone else was on this part of the river, but never found anyone or anything. To this date, that is the scariest moment of my life, and though I am 36 years old and my wife mocks me, I still sleep with a nightlight. I had taken a job working for a company based up in the mountains. They offered me a cottage to stay in while working there. It was an old home built into the side of the mountain and surrounded by the forest. I lived in the basement, which had been converted into a small living space with a bathroom, kitchen, sleeping area, and laundry room. The laundry room was L-shaped and had a door that went out the back and into the surrounding forest. The door that led to the forest was locked from the inside and was quite difficult to open. I never used that door and always kept it locked. The rest of the house was empty, but I didn't have access to it. After a day of work, I returned to my little basement for an evening reading and playing solitaire. I turned off my lamp and started to nod off when I heard a noise. The noise was like a wood creaking. I played it off as my imagination, but then it repeated. I thought, maybe one of the cabinets in the kitchen was latched in properly and swung open? I checked, but all the cabinets were secure. I opened my closet thinking maybe something in there had made the sound, but again, nothing. The last place to look was the laundry room. I opened the door that connected the house to the laundry room and was instantly hit by a gust of cold night air. I slowly turned the corner and witnessed the door that led to the outside was swaying in the nighttime breeze. I don't know what happened. Was there someone in the laundry room just waiting for me to fall asleep before sneaking out? Was it something supernatural? Either way, there are few times I had ever felt such genuine horror.
It finally started raining here, so I took my son, who was 14 at the time, out mushroom hunting over the weekend. It was later than we normally go, and sun goes down much earlier, but we were taking a quick trail to the river and back in hopes finding turkey tails or chanterelles. We took a wrong turn and ended up going through a big field, which the trail would take us back around to the main trail to the river. As we walked toward the main trail, the last group of people had left, and it was just me and my son. We walked along, and out of the thicket side trail came this weird man. He had a dog with him that was alert at his side. He was staring at us as we walked closer towards him. Then he started waving at us, this really weird, slow wave. I was immediately uncomfortable and goosebumpy, but didn't want to be impolite, so I half-hearted waved back while staring back and telling my son to slow up a bit. I didn't want to actually meet up at the junction. After a full minute of us dwaddling, the guy slowly turned and began walking down the trail towards the main trail. I was wary walking, didn't want to go too fast, and we stopped to look at some plants, so the guy and dog got further down the trail, which curved to the right and continued on two blocks to the junction. I was thinking, if this was a creepy let's not meet, this dude will be waiting around that corner. And sure enough, he was standing at the junction off to the left and toward the parking lot. And to the right was a .6 mile trail to the river. Dude was just standing there with his dog staring at us, not moving at all. Both my son and I were like, holy shit, what the hell? Let's keep moving wide to the right and saying he looks old. We could run faster than him and just generally planning for freaky deaky just in case. He just kept staring at us as we approached. I asked if he was okay and kept staring back. He was greasy haired, tiny round glasses, a blue windbreaker, plaid long shorts, about 50 years old. His dog was a small beagle mix. He didn't answer me at all, just kept staring. He turned to the right and walked about a block. I had my phone cam facing me so I could watch him over my shoulder. And the only movement was him slowly shifting his direction to continue staring at us. I didn't say anything else to him. It was moderately unsettling, his stare. Made more so by his lack of response, emotionless face, weird tiny glasses, and a slow wave at us like a zombie mother effer. He did leave because on our way back, he was no longer standing on the trail. So, hey freaky deaky forest zombie dude, for sure, please stay in the thickets of the woods. I hope we never meet again. Dear listeners, this next story has foul language. Listener discretion is advised. Tennessee has some real bum fucky people out in nature. I hiked all around while in school there. Made some good memories with a girl in the enveloping nature. Tennessee has good roads to popular hiking sites and tons of many trails branching off. Sometimes you need to know what to look for as far as trail markers go, because the interesting ones are always a good way out. There's one spring waterfall that spills across a mossy granite wall, towering over a shallow stream that empties into a decent-sized pond. I went out there with a friend last time, and we got separated on the way out. I have no fucking clue how this happened. We've each been hiking for over 10 years. I've run over it a thousand times in my mind, and it has to be this one ledge system. To get to the top of the fall, you need to take a longish detour that has a lot of old wooden railing and a three-way branching ledge system. 
Okay, so I've taken all three routes and ended up at the same spot. They take about three to four minutes to blast through, and they're kind of like rocky corridors. I don't take the left one anymore because I'm 90% sure these big stains in the middle are blood. Don't want to know what happened there. It's odd because the left is by far the most inviting. Flowers blossom from vines that are etched into the moss matted bedrock. Anyways, I'm 45 seconds ahead of her and opt for the right path when I realize I should tell her to avoid the left. It's really hard to reverse given the sloping angle of the path and a few short drops that become narrow climbs. Fuck it. Faster if I speed through and yell down. I get out of the right corridor, swing around to where the middle path drops off. Yell. No reply. She took left. I run over and climb into the left corridor, thinking she saw the stains and freaked out. It looks like someone got bludgeoned to death, to be fair. She's fucking gone. Ashley? Nothing. And that's what made my hair stand up. I literally heard nothing. No birds, no hum of the forest, not even wind. Just myself and the babbling water. I traced left all the way back and noted a few side passages if you miss a couple of the jumps. No bodies were in there or the middle, though. Thank God. I figure I may as well get to the top of the falls where I can get somewhat of an aerial view. I get there and Ashley is sitting there waiting for me. She says she took the left path with the trail guide. What? There are no trail guides. There are rangers, but she knows the difference. They wouldn't be in the rock labyrinth. This guy had a uniform on and a trail authority visor on. She knew what I was thinking based on my face and agreed that we should reverse course ASAP without us saying anything out loud. Man, it's weird when you know you're being watched. So yeah, we pretend we are going back to the car real quick, about 30 minutes, to get more water and so I left some fish food in the little crevice like I always did and we left. She showed me this weird side passage that could not have existed a year before. I walked all the way around. You had to crouch, but you could walk through the labyrinth if you kept left. Hindsight, we should have taken another way. I think he lives in those tunnels. She said he kept trying to lead her in different directions, but she just followed the light and saw him standing in the tunnel as she walked the rest of the trip to the top. That means he was there when I was looking for her. That means she followed him before seeing the blood splatters all over the floor and walls. And that's not the totally fucked part. The fucking fish food was on the hood of my car. Her water bottle was gone, too. She had it cabarinered to her pack, so he must have snuck up and taken it at some point. We hiked really fast, too. Never went back and refuse to. This is maybe more of a near encounter, but it was still unsettling. My partner and I decided we were going to go hiking on a trail in a national forest area yesterday. It is a fairly remote area when we drove a variety of dirt roads to get there, but we were excited to hike during a beautiful time of the year with the leaves changing, right here out in the middle of nowhere. The trailhead had a small parking area, which was approximately 200 feet before a river crossing and a bridge. As we pulled into the parking area, we noticed a line of five people on the other side of the river embankment across the bridge. They were all standing in a neutral stance, spread legs, arms straight out, either facing our direction or the opposite direction with their feet nearly touching. It was difficult to tell with the distance. 
There was maybe a slight gap in the road for a car to pass through, but they took up most of the road. They were wearing all black, and it looked like they might even have black mask on, as we couldn't see any color of features indicative of faces. As we pulled into the parking area, my partner and I pondered what was going on over there. She stared at them for about 10 seconds, and we discovered that they were completely motionless like statues. At that point, both of our guts were raising alarms, and we decided to hightail it out of there. As we drove away, they continued to stand there motionless. Thankfully, nobody followed us. We are still trying to figure out what happened there. Was it a hunting group? If so, why weren't they wearing orange? Was it a teenager group playing a prank? Was it just our overactive imaginations? Just as a friendly reminder, there is a problem of people disappearing in national forests and parks. So, be sure to stay safe and stay vigilant. I was hiking the Arizona Trail in the Superstition Mountains in May of last year. I had run out of water that morning. It was blistering hot. It was a weekday. I saw no people for like three days. And my pack was far too heavy. I was an inexperienced hiker. I ended up taking a wrong turn and wandering off trail for about a mile. It's easier to do than you think. At the end of this wrong turn, I found an unmarked grave that had no business being in a national forest. I didn't panic, but realizing I had made a wrong turn while I was already out of water, and didn't for sure know where my next source was, really set me in the dangers of hiking in the desert. There is no greater hardship a human being can endure than thirst. It weakens your whole body and makes your mind slow and delirious. It takes away your morale and your will to live. I ended up flagging a jeep on a road that follows the top of the mountains at the end of the day. If I had not found the jeep, I would have been out of water until later the next day, which was only a puddle of water. I'm not sure if I would have made it if I didn't find that jeep, but I don't think I would have been the first person to have died in the superstitions. This summer, I was out in the dark canyon wilderness of Utah after two weeks of driving and backpacking around the country alone. The plan was a seven-day trip, and after a few days of setbacks, I was on my last night. By this time, I was already a little scared of the dark, but that's just what happens when you are your own company for three weeks. Anyway, on the sixth day, I found an awesome elk antler and put it on my shoulders about a mile into the day's hike. As anyone who has poorly packed a pack will attest, just slapping 15 pounds on top of your pack is a bad idea. About halfway through my planned death march, my hip was getting sore, and I blew through my water. I decided that I would stop early and get some water. Luckily, I found a few puddles in a dryish riverbed and made camp. I started boiling some water when it struck me. If there's a skanky water here, there may be good water upstream. So, up I went upstream. Just as the canyon boxed out a little spring filled the bed with deliciously cold, refreshing water. I drank on my hands and knees before realizing I didn't bring my water bottles. Whatever, I hiked a half mile or so back to the camp and grabbed them. This is where it gets weird. On my trip back up, I kept feeling really vulnerable and uncomfortable. Every little rustle in the bushes set me off. I could hear birds calling in the distance that set me off. I kept looking for something following me. I can only describe my emotion as pure terror. 
It got to the point where I picked up a branch just in case a cougar tried to attack me. I still kept telling myself that it was just paranoia and I'm fine, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I finally got to the water and filled up my camelback and bottle, constantly looking over my shoulder. The feeling of unease was still with me when I headed back down the gulch. There I came upon a fresh mountain lion print placed directly between two that I made on the way up. It's one thing to think that your fears are unfounded paranoia. It's much, much worse to know they are true. Where do I start? So I was just about 24 years old when my cousin Charlie had gotten throat cancer. He wasn't really my cousin, he was my dad's cousin, but for whatever reason, I always called him Cousin Charlie. Anyways, he and his wife lived up around San Luis Obispo, and when he was finally recovering from cancer, he went to stay in his estate in mainland Hawaii. At one point, he needed someone to babysit his house in St. Louis, and I volunteered. Fast forward, I'm staying at his place by myself. We're talking satellite internet and television slower than a snail. I would found myself enthralled in a Lord of the Rings marathon and proceeded to stay up until around 2.30 a.m. Changing the channel meant whatever channel I was clicking meant it would choose four stations down from my selection. So I was hesitant to change the channel. The marathon ends and I proceeded to make some green tea. That's when I hear it. A distant scream calls across the valley below. I knew it was a human scream, but for some reason I just refused to believe it. The thing about houses inland from San Luis is that you have a lot of room between your neighbors. We're talking about two miles apart from each other. If someone played music on the other side of the hill, you had no problem hearing it. I thought maybe they screamed because they were watching a scary film or perhaps they were playing a board game. I really don't know. I just did my best to imagine it was me over-exaggerating. About two minutes had gone by and I passed it off at this time, getting lost in infomercials. That's when I heard something familiar to a firecracker, but... Then I heard it multiple times. Something didn't seem right. So I grabbed the nearest blunt object and headed upstairs. My cousin Charlie has a 360 degree second deck, which I proceeded to go and take watch on with a fire poker. Like that would do me any good. I listened, but I could only hear the wind. I would later end up falling asleep in one of the rocking chairs and then waking up about 40 minutes later. What I later found out from my cousin Charlie is that a man had got into a bad argument with his wife and shot her as she ran from the house. I also later found out that because I was the only one who had left the outside lights on, that she had run towards me but died from her wounds about 60% of the way here. It still gives me chills to this day. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true middle-of-nowhere stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time... Please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.